And welcome everyone to Sports Talk Line, where we talk sports 24-7, 365. And on this week's episode of Battle for the Big East, we got Mike DeCourcy from Fox Sports, because guess what? It's March, the madness has begun, and we're going to talk about brackets. And oh boy, was it a maddening week in the Big East for pretty much everyone involved, Mike. What do you say about that? Yeah, I don't think it was a good week for anybody. No. Uh, when you think about it, you start at the top, obviously the disappointment uh, to have a terrific young man and, and a great player like Colin Gillespie uh, get an injury that was described, that was not, uh, it, it was not narrowed down what the specific injury was to this point, but it was described as significant. And that's, that, that's not good. It's hard to recover from significant in time for, uh, for the NCAA tournament a week later. I, I, we can't say, I, we don't know enough to say it's impossible, but it would seem unlikely. Uh, then you look at Creighton and the awful situation there. Uh, uh, Seton Hall goes down on the road to UConn. Uh, you've, or excuse me, at home against UConn. You've got Xavier losing on the road to Georgetown. The, the, when, I, when After they beat Creighton, there was a good feeling about Xavier. And, and understandably so. That was the win they needed to add to their, uh, to their earlier Oklahoma win to say it was, to, to be able to say, see, it wasn't just one night. And then they had those two games, those two road games against Georgetown and Marquette, both of which have shown they are capable of beating NCAA tournament quality teams. And they got and they and they and they got it at Georgetown, and now they still have to go to Marquette. So, not a great situation for them. Honestly, the only one that had a good week, uh, a positive week, was UConn. I don't think you can say anything bad about their week. They won at Seton Hall. Everybody's still healthy, uh, so the, the the Huskies are the one team that can feel good about where they stand today. And I know they're extremely excited about the prospect of going back to the Garden to play in the Big East tournament for the first time you know, in, in, since 2013. Yes, Mike, I totally agree with you. Right now, UConn's the hottest team, and it's bring, it's echoing memories of Kemba Walker and Shabazz Napier, where it's like, oh, is this going to be one of those feeble runs where James Boak Knight, because it looks like Boak Knight's gone after this year anyway, which, which I think everyone agrees with. Um, but, you know, UConn's going to be an interesting team. But speaking of interesting teams, you kind of hit on every team so far in the Big East. In your last four out on Monday of this week, starting off March 1st, you had Xavier and Seton Hall as the last four in. As of right now, going into the final weekend of Big East regular season play, are both of those teams still in your bracket uh, to make the NCAA tournament? I have not done the Friday bracket compilation yet, but I don't have much doubt that Seton Hall will be out. Xavier maybe still has a chance to hang on to the last spot. It's somewhat dependent on uh, where, where I grade Wichita, a few others. I, I had Stanford firmly in supplanting, supplanting Boise State, which lost earlier this week to Fresno. That Fresno lost it, all the all the Big East bubble teams can say, yeah, but we're not we're not the guys that lost to Fresno. So there is that. Uh, and that put Stanford in. And then, oh, by the way, yeah, we're, we lost to Georgetown, but we didn't lose by 35. And I know there's a big disparity between Georgetown's efficacy and Southern California's. But still, you can't lose by that much like Stanford did and feel good about your space in the field. So uh, Xavier still has a chance to be in the Friday bracket based on the, the struggles of others. But I think that in order to go into Big East tournament week inside my bracket, inside the other uh, the other prominent media brackets. I think that Xavier at the minimum has to win at Marquette. And as I said, that's a real challenge. Uh, Marquette's got good players. They played some really good basketball, struggled at times, uh, but that's that's a real tough one for for Marquette to get. If they get it, it probably won't be rewarded at the level of uh, that of the difficulty that'll uh, be required to to secure that victory. Uh, but at least it keeps the Musketeers toward the front of the line, if not inside the bracket. Yes, and if you doubt how good of a team Marquette is, just ask Roy Williamson in North Carolina. Um, boy, did they lay a shellacking a few weeks ago, and that probably helped out the Big East with the net rankings and everything like that. 
but you, you kind of mentioned Xavier is is hanging on by a thread. So if they went out there, okay. You said Seton Hall drops out. What does Seton Hall need to do? What else does needs to happen for Seton Hall to grab one of those final bids? Well, I, it, it, what they have to do is do well in the Big East tournament. Uh, and what that exactly would be, I, I, I don't have the projected bracket in front of me and I don't, and the projections don't always hold anyway, but they probably need to get, it would be good for them if they could to get at least one win against a bu bubble team, which in their case, I guess Xavier would be the only one that would qualify as that or, and, and a, and a win over a team that is likely in like Yukon or, or Creighton or Villanova, uh, or, you know, obviously I, I think Yukon has the ability with James Booknight to be able to win the championship. I, I thought that even before Colin Gillespie was injured and, and Villanova was facing the possibility of having to go forward without him. I, I, they haven't had a lot of opportunity to play with James and they, they haven't won all of their toughest games with him, but what they missed was they were working towards something when they played Creighton early January at home and took them to overtime. Creighton, UConn was on the cusp of something. They were, they were getting there. They were getting to the point where, they had a chance to be significant, maybe even challenged for the conference championship. And then James got hurt, missed more than a month. And that idea of winning the league prop pretty much went aside. But making the tournament, knowing he was going to be back inside the season, still was there for them. And I think now that target to try to be able to hold up the trophy at the Garden next Saturday night, I think that's a real goal for them. And if they are able to do that, I would, I would not put past them the possibility of sort of pole vaulting over the eight, nine game and into a seven seed where they would be a real threat. Remember last seven seed to win the NCAA championship, 2014 UConn Huskies. You know, you know that, that, that is a good point. Uh, and speaking of good points, hopefully you guys have all hit that like and subscribe button to follow us on sports talk line, where you can see all these episodes for battle for the big East. But, you know, you, you kind of touched on UConn and James Boaknight had the injury, but you, you also mentioned Colin Gillespie, who, as the time of this recording, we don't know about the injury. It looks like he's going to be missing some time. How will the NCAA tournament now going in, let's say they announce, we don't know the injury, but let's say they announce Colin Gillespie is out for the rest of the year. Will that announcement impact Villanova's seed in the NCAA tournament, or there, or will the committee look at it like they had a full Colin Gillespie when they're seeding because Villanova still has some pretty good players on that team. Yeah, it, 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 it depends somewhat on how they perform. And I, I, I covered the, the most famous case of this. I was the beat writer for the Cincinnati Bearcats in the 1999-2000 season when Kenyon Martin was the national player of the year, uh, the best player in college basketball in, a, in, a, in, in, in that year and, and, and several others, it was, it, that, was, that was a heck of a year that Kenyon put together. And when he got hurt early in the first conference tournament game for Cincinnati, they ended up losing that game. And that's all the committee had to go on was what did Cincinnati look like for, let's say, 35 minutes after Kenyon Martin got hurt. And I, I, I honestly didn't think that was enough for them to go on to change their seating. I, I, what what you you're now you're judging an zero and one team. I, I didn't think they set a good precedent there, and not to mention the fact that that same year Lauren Woods didn't play at the end of the year for Arizona and didn't play in the tournament, and they still got a one seed and their athletic director was a member of the committee. So that that's the history of this. Uh, for for book night, it, excuse me for for Colin Gillespie. I think it comes down to how do the Wildcats look without him. If they make the Big East final, I don't think they'll take them down a line. If they win the Big East tournament, they might even still rise. Okay. Right now, I have them at a in, in sort of squarely in the middle of the three line. Uh, they had the potential to climb back to a two and an outside shot uh, at, at a one if uh, you know if if the Big Ten teams faltered. Uh, but uh, I I I still think um, that they. It, it really comes down to 
what they do in New York and, and how, how, how they close the regular season as well. It, giving the, the committee no reason to change their minds about you is important now. And it won't be easy because Colin was such a big part of what they did, have done for the, for the entire year, such a terrific player. Mm -hmm. But they still do, like you said, have other excellent players on that team. Uh, Jeremiah Robinson Earl, a guy I projected in the preseason as a first team All-American, had a fine year. He hasn't had a first team All-America year. I still think he has first team All-America ability. He's not going to make it now, but he could play like that for all of March. Uh, he wouldn't be the first. Uh, he certainly has the potential. And I, I realize he's not a point guard, but that doesn't mean he can't elevate his play and maybe make point guard less consequential. Mm -hmm. And I think, too, you know, since we're talking about injuries, you mentioned point guard, the, the most impactful injury and the most unique injury um, so far this season in the Big East was James Boaknight. And, and UConn kind of got hit from both angles. They had their star player who is a projected first round pick, you know, miss sick, you know, miss significant time. And then you have it where UConn also missed some significant time with COVID pauses. You know, so James Boaknight is getting back to, you know, is back in the rotation. Uh, Villanova has only lost one game since Boaknight has come back, and that was to Villanova. Now, how is the committee going to look at it? Are they going to look at, you know, I, I think, you know, I guess there's two questions involved in this. One, how the committee look at UConn itself when it comes to seeding? Second, how will they look at the teams that beat UConn without both night? You know, I think that's something else to look at where it's like, would that still be a quality win? Let's say if they beat them on the road, or is it is UConn still a good enough team without both night? to impact other teams' seedings, and that could be a potential for the Big East anyway, another team gets in or not. But what, what do you think about that, Mike? It, it's essentially impossible to go and do all of that. They say, okay, well, Book Night was here, wasn't here in this time, so that's not a good win for whoever beat him. I don't know, Marquette or whoever. I don't remember exactly who they played, but that team, it's not a good win for them, so throw that. Now, they can't do that because there's too many cases. There are 350 teams give or take, uh, probably around, well, probably around 345 now uh, that actually played this season. 345 teams, roughly. To go through every one of those is, would be a maddening exercise. You pretty much have to take, this is who your team is, this is who it is. Now, when it comes to seeding, if, if, if you have absent a significant player for a period of time, and then that player returns and, and demonstrates that you go from being good to great or slightly better than good to nearly great. What they don't want to do is, is put a team, let's say that if that player had played the entire season, that team would have been a likely four seed, say, just as an example. I don't know that the Huskies would have been or not, but let's just say uh, they don't want to put that team in an eight, nine game because all of a sudden, now that, that, that your number one seed in that region has to play against the team that's a natural four seed. It's not fair. That's what they're trying to avoid. So if UConn were to establish that it was say a natural six seed, by, and how would they do that? Well, the problem that they've had to this point is that during the time that James has been available, they've only had four games against teams that are tournament contenders after beating Seton Hall, which is now out, now likely out of the field. They are three and one in those. They are, I'm sorry. They are two and two in those games. They beat SC, they beat Seton Hall. They lost to Villanova and Creighton. And so it, you can't really say, wow, you know, that's a, they would have been a, a two seed or a three seed if they'd had them the whole year. Now, if they go out and win the big East tournament, and that changes the dynamics a little bit because like you said, they're eight and two. Now, if you get another win on the weekend, that's nine and two. Then you had three more. Now they're 12 and two, including victory in the conference tournament final. Now maybe you're thinking about, well, we got to keep these away from, we got to keep the Huskies away from the really good teams. And we're probably running short of six seeds anyway, or five, whatever the line is. Cause I'll tell you when you're doing the brackets, you get to a certain line and you say, well, I know what a three seed looks like, and I know what a five seed looks like, but I don't have anything that looks like a four seed. Uh, that happens. 
So maybe they, maybe that that team, that Huskies team would then be qualified for some spot in the bracket that their overall record might not say. But generally, they try they they they're going to select the teams based on their on what they accomplish, and then seed them based on to an extent based on how danger dangerous are those teams going to be to the teams that have earned higher seeds. All right. And now the last question before we go, we kind of touched on it a little bit. Creighton uh, made headlines for a locker room comment made by Coach Crate by Coach uh, McDermott. Um, but you know, sticking to what's on the court, how do you see Creighton right now going into the NCAA tournament? What seed do you see them on? Because I'm guessing Villanova will be ahead of Creighton. So will Creighton fall into that four line, four five line? Where do you see them going as of now? Well, prior to the loss to uh prior to the loss against villanova i had them seated uh I, they, they had been fluctuating uh between four and five and i had them seated as a five i would say that subsequent to that that loss they probably are looking at a six it some of it depends on activity that will occur after we after we finish our conversation and before my bracket is published on friday afternoon but they're probably looking at about a six right now, but it's a, it's a, it's an interesting deal because they've got a very strong record, even with the, the Nova loss, a very strong record against the top two quadrants. And then they have three losses against teams in quad three. That's a really high number for teams that are in the range we're talking about. I'm not sure that anybody else is close to that number. So that, that makes them a difficult team to see. And what makes you an easy team to seed is then basically going out and declaring, no, we're this or we're that. We are, no, we really should be a four. Think about us as a four by us going out and winning this game, that game, the other game. Or we're really not that good. You can drop us down, you know, to a seven maybe or an eight. You know, if we, if we really screw it up, you can put us in as an eight. The teams tell you what they want to be seeded, what they, whether they want to be selected when, in a case of bubble teams. So obviously this has been a very, uh, you know, disappointing week at Creighton in so many levels. What do the basketball players want to get out of this going forward? How much, you know, how much can they believe in, in their circumstance in order to put the effort together that is necessary to win at the Big East level? I don't have an answer to that. They weren't sharp at all against Villanova but they quite possibly would have lost that game even if none of this had happened. So I don't think we can necessarily grade them on that. We'll have a better idea after they go to New York and we'll see whether or not they're the Creighton that had been a pretty sharp team prior to, to Greg McDermott's comments a week ago. All right, Mike, before we leave, can you tell us where people can find you on social media? Yes, uh, my Twitter handle is at TSN Mike, that's as in the sporting news, at TSN Mike uh, at twi on Twitter. And then, of course, you can find me uh, doing uh, bracket conversations. I will be on a lot for, for Big East fans. I will be on every day uh, on the in between games, half times, whatever, um, talking brackets uh, in, in, during the Big East tournament, all, every day of the tournament. And you can find me as well doing the insider pieces uh, for Inside the Big East, uh, the weekly uh, Fox Sports program that focuses on personalities and, 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 and performances in, in the Big East. And uh, you can find my work if you prefer to go directly to sportingnews.com. You can find all of my work uh, on the college basketball page or archive there. So lots of places to find me. And, and if you want to wander away from the Big East, still appearing. Uh, regularly on the Big Ten Network as well. Yes, the Big Ten, that, that's something, oh boy, the Big Ten's a strong conference this year. They just love to beat each other up, to say the least. But thanks for coming on, Mike, especially during this very busy time for you at March. I guess accountants and bracketologists have a busy time at this time of year. I want to thank you again for coming on. And remember, listen like you play with intensity.